Hi class, in this video we'll be talking about functions. We've been using functions all semester to do our drawings and projects using P5 and JavaScript, but we haven't written our own functions, which is what we're going to learn how to do today. By writing our own functions, we can consolidate functionality and components of our code to be reusable. Instead of drawing one button or having one button that triggers a sound, we can draw many buttons that trigger different sounds, for example. So we'll be using that with our sound sampler project that we've been working on the past couple weeks. But functions are really useful for any type of project where you might want to repeat some code or make small changes to it without just having to copy and paste a bunch of code over and over again. So let's get started. I'm going to open up GitHub. I'm sure I've got my MMP210 repository up to date. I'm going to take my sound version 3 and duplicate that one more time. So we have sound version 4. And we'll continue to work with some of the sounds that we've created. And we'll also, but first we'll start by adding some custom functions and going over how functions work. And then we'll bring our sounds back in to complete the project. So I'm going to take the MMP210 folder and open that up in Sublime Text. And go to sound version 4. And let's go ahead and open up the index.html just to update the number here. Everything else looks good. We have this instruction to click the shapes. That might still be useful, so I'll leave that for now. On sketch.js, I'm going to delete everything that we wrote in the last version of the project and start from scratch. So I'm going to save and call this custom functions. And this is going to be our mouse interaction sound sampler. So we've been using functions throughout the semester. We have the function setup. We also have functions like create canvas. So just creating a simple P5 sketch uses a bunch of functions. We have function draw and the function background. And we can draw a background color. So let's open that up and then talk about what each of our functions is doing. So I'm going to start the Sublime server and go to localhost 8080, open up MMP210, and I'll have to type in my URL because I haven't added it yet, sound version 4, and I'm going to have the console open. One of the things that we benefit from when we're using P5 is that P5 creates some functions for us. For example, the create canvas function, which creates the P5 canvas that we see right here and the background function, which draws our gray background. We also have functions like ellipse and rectangle, which we can use to draw shapes and image and text to draw images and text and a bunch of other functions that we've covered throughout the semester. We also have the function draw and the function setup, which are slightly different because rather than using the function to create a canvas, we're actually declaring the function or creating it. The difference here, again, having to do with P5, is that P5 knows we're going to create a setup function, and so it's going to attempt to call that setup function. P5 also knows that we're going to create a draw function, and it's going to attempt to call that draw function as it does the animation loop at 60 frames per second. So these are some of the advantages that P5 brings, is that it has its own functions we can use, and it also has some basic ideas for functions that we can create, like setup, draw, mouse pressed, some preload and some of the other functions we've used. But if we were writing JavaScript from scratch, we'd have to create our own functions. And so we would do both of what we see here. We would write function and create the function. And then we would also call the function here. So we haven't really discussed how a function works in that sense that we the function is both created and then it's also called. So we can create our own function, and then we can call it using our program. So I'm just going to create kind of a silly function to start, just to show you that it doesn't really matter what your function is called, as long as you name it consistently. So I'm going to create a function called banana. All of this function is going to do is it's going to console.log the word banana. This is just an example. These things don't have to match. Uh, I'm just creating this new function called banana, and I want it to do something so we can see that it works. So I'm just making it write something into the console. So we'll see when I reload the page, you may have expected to see the word banana appear over here, but it's not there. This is because we have only declared this function. 
A function declaration is sort of like a variable declaration. Instead of using var, we use the word function. And then we create a name just like we did with a var. And then we use parentheses in this case because it's a function. So that's one place where variables are different. Usually with a variable following the variable name, instead of parentheses, we would have an equal sign. And then we would assign it to something like a number. And that would be the end of our statement. With a function, we use parentheses to say that it's a function. And then we use curly brackets to create our function scope. The function scope is where we put all of the code that we want to run when the function is called or invoked. So let's invoke our function. Invoke is a fancy word for saying, I want you to do the function now. So now if I say banana, followed by parentheses, we can see that our console has logged the banana. And because this is a function, we can run it again. So we can log banana as many times as we like. I could also call banana from another function, like function mouse pressed. And now every time I click the mouse, it'll log banana again. So a function is basically creating a little bit of code that we save to call later. So for example, when we create the setup function, we're saying that we want to create the canvas. And when P5 loads in our browser, it does that for us. Okay, so let's make our uh, banana a little bit more useful. So instead of just logging banana, let's actually draw a banana. And instead of drawing it in mouse pressed, I'll draw it in draw. So I'm going to draw a banana here. And so to draw my banana, I'm going to set the fill to yellow. Actually, I'm going to use a stroke because I'm going to use a curve. It's not going to be the best banana in the world, but I'm just going to make a curve. I'm going to translate first to the center on X and I'll put it about 100 on Y. And then I'm going to make a curve. So I'm just going to do a curve and a curve is a bit tricky. So what I'm going to do to start is I'm going to repeat the first two points. So I'm going to start at zero. 0 on x and y, 0, 0 again. And then I'm going to do another one on 0x and just move down 100 on y and repeat it the same thing. So a curve is like a line. You'll see it's a line now. Let's make it a bit bigger. So I'll say stroke weight is 10. I can make it even a bit bigger than that. Let's try 16. And so with a curve, there's two points here and here. With the first point, what is actually going to happen is this point is going to become a control point. And the farther away we pull that point, the more of a curve it's going to create around this way. Same thing over here. So the middle two points are the actual points of our banana. The top is 0, 0, and the bottom is 0, 100. And then the control points are going to pull the banana away. So let's start by trying to pull the x point away on the top. So I'm going to move that over to 100. So you can see that is now curving. So I put that point and I moved it basically over here. So now you can see it's curving like that. So if we move y down a little bit, that might make a nicer curve. And if we pull x out a bit, that's a more dramatic curve. You can play with that till you get what you like. And then we can do the same thing on the other side. So let's pull x out a bit. OK. And I'll pull y up a bit, or maybe down a bit to straighten it out. OK, so that kind of looks like a banana. I might want to play around with that a bit more. I could maybe repeat the curve. So maybe I'll say stroke is 0, and the stroke weight is 1 and then draw the same curve so I get a nice, a nice little line in the banana. Maybe let's make it even a bit wider. And so that looks pretty good for a banana. Obviously, we could play a bit around with that a bit more, but I'm pretty happy as far as that goes. And so let's draw some more bananas. So one thing to notice so far is that this is a lot of code that if I wanted to draw more bananas, I'd have to repeat this entire thing. 
So one of the nice things about drawing using functions is that instead of repeating all of this code over and over again, I can just repeat that function. But in order to move the banana around, so if I just draw a banana again, well, actually, I see the banana is moved over here because I forgot to push and pop. So whenever you translate, especially inside of a function, make sure to push and pop. And if this stuff with the translate and the curve doesn't really make that much sense to you, don't worry about it. You, you can just use regular shapes and stuff like that, or even use an image, doesn't really matter here. Okay, so we've got our banana. So if we draw it twice, we just see it in the same place. So we're gonna wanna move it somewhere, right? That's a nice thing about using translate is I can just put a value in here, and then we can use what's called arguments. So of course you remember when we draw a circle, if we have an ellipse at like 100, 100, 100, that gives us a circle over there. And if we have an ellipse at 500 and 200 and 100, then we get another circle. These arguments are being passed into a function like the banana, except it's an ellipse that's predefined by P5. So if we want to give our banana a couple different positions, let's do one at 100, 100, and one at 200, 100. We need to pass those values into our function. And so we, the way we do that is by using arguments. So we can have x and then comma y. So that should look pretty familiar. That's a very typical way for arguments to be defined. And that's essentially the same thing as saying variable x equals whatever this value is. So through calling the function, this value is passed into here, and this value is passed into here. And the order is important here. If we call this x, then this should be the x value we want. If we call this y, then this should be the y value we want. So this is essentially saying like x equals 100, but because it's a function with its own area for code, we can implicitly declare that variable by giving it an argument. So I'm going to say with arguments here. So now we can replace the translate with x and y. And since we're using push and pop with the translate to move our sketch around, we don't really have to worry about where our banana, the rest of the values in our banana. OK, so now I have two bananas. And if I want another one, I can just copy and paste and put it over here. Now I have three bananas. So using a function, I can reuse this fairly long block of code, and I can change it by making simple modifications with variable arguments. So one thing you do have to be careful about is calling a banana without any parameters. See, it still managed to draw the banana because the parameters only affect this translate function. So there's not gonna be an error here because although one of the, the functions doesn't work, the rest of our functions do work. So you always need to make sure you see what the arguments for a function are. Sometimes the arguments are optional, as we've seen with P5. What other arguments could you add here? Could you add a rotation? Could you add a color? Any other arguments that you want to add, just add an argument after Y. You could add size, rotation, color, and then just add that to your banana. So now let's bring back in our sounds so that we can show how to create a P5 function, um, our own custom function to create a button that will um, play a sound when we, when we click on the button. And so we'll wrap in the code that we learned in the previous video this week. I'm just gonna leave this banana function down here. But now we'll make a series of buttons using different functions. So I'm gonna load a couple sounds up first. So I'm gonna create some variables. So I have um, the explosion sound. So I have explosion one, explosion two, and explosion three. And then I also have my chicken sound and my background music sound. So I'm gonna quickly preload all of those. I'm gonna say function preload. And I'm gonna say explosion one equals load sound, explosion dash one dot wave. And I'm gonna copy that and paste it a couple times and say two and three. And then I'll 
preload my chicken sound. And my background music. OK, so now that I've got all my sounds ready to go, I'm just going to collapse that. Now let's create some buttons. So I'm going to start with my explosions. And I'm going to create a button that plays the explosion. And so last time we created buttons just using hard-coded numbers. But now we're going to convert those numbers into variables so that we can create multiple buttons in different places. So let's start by working out the logic and draw. And then we'll move it into a function. So to start, I'm just going to draw my ellipse. So I have ellipse at 100, 100, 100. Okay, so let's save all those values and variables. So variable x equals 100, variable y equals 100, variable s for size equals 100. So now I have x, y, and s for size. For the fill of my ellipse, I'm going to fill yellow if I'm hovering over the ellipse, and I'm going to fill uh, plum if I'm not. So I'm going to first calculate the distance of the ellipse. So I'm going to say variable d for distance equals dist between x and y and mouse x and mouse y. So you can already see how using variables is going to make my code easier because I have x, y here. So I don't have to remember that x is 100 to type 100 here. I can just use the same variable and it's going to match up. So I've calculated the distance between the mouse and my button. And now I'm just going to say if the distance is less than size over 2, so the radius of the circle or ellipse, then I'm going to fill yellow. So that's if I'm inside the ellipse. Otherwise, I'm going to fill plum. I'm going to just put a comment here, calculate distance inside the button, outside the button. Oh, I got an error here because background is something that P5 needs, so I'm going to change that to BG real quick. Sorry about that. OK, so now I have my button. And if I go inside, then it highlights. First, let's add another button. And then we will add our sounds. So to translate this whole thing into a button, one thing I could do is I could just copy and paste the whole thing. And then I could change this to like 200. And now I have two buttons. But this is pretty crazy, right? And if I wanted to do it again, I'd have to do it all again. So let's not do that. Instead, let's convert this into a function. So we have function button. And so we first take our variables. So x is 100. So we're going to put x here. And I'll start writing my button up here. So the first value that we need is 100. So now we can get rid of x. Variable y equals 100. So let's put 100 here, put y down here, and get rid of y. And then finally, the size is 100. So let's move the size here. And the variable for s down here. The rest of this can go directly into my button function because this variable is being declared based on the x and y and the mouse x, mouse y, which are these are going to be global values, and these are going to come in as arguments. So we don't need to add d as an argument. And that makes all of our uh, variables. So we'll move that into our button, make sure that still works. So our button still works here. And so let's just make another button. So we'll make, we can make a few buttons of the same size. And they all have the same functionality. So the reason they have the same functionality is because each time we draw or call this button function, it's going through all of the same code. So it's looking at the x and y versus the mouse x and mouse y. It's calculating the distance. And then it's doing the fill for three separate buttons. So that's pretty cool. We can start to do a lot of different stuff with our code.
So now let's add another argument to our button to play a sound. So once we calculate that the button is inside of the mouse, we can also make a change based on whether or not the mouse is pressed. So we can say if mouse is pressed, then we can say explosion one dot play. And this will play the same sound for each button. So you notice there's a bit of distortion because the button function is inside of the draw function. So when we do hold the mouse down, it's going to be triggering over and over and over again. So let's just add another condition here and say, and explosion one dot is playing. And then let's set that to false by putting a not here. So this means that it has to not be playing. So now we should get that a bit better. So now the sample just plays once each time we click. So the next thing is, can we change this sound? And just like we can change the X and Y position of our button, as well as the size, we can add in another sound. So let's add a sound in here. We have three explosions. And so let's add our three explosions. So it doesn't really matter what order the arguments go in as long as they're used in the correct order. So we'll add our three explosions. And then after the S, I'm just gonna use sound as a generic for our argument. So each explosion will go into each button as sound. And I'll just replace sound with each explosion inside of the button. So now we have our three separate sounds. It can be kind of confusing because it's a bit abstract now, but keep in mind that these values, when they go inside the button, become these variable names. And these variable names only exist as long as this button function is being executed. As soon as one button ends, and the next button begins, these values disappear, and then they get added again inside of a new function. So this way we can reuse and add lots of different buttons. Since we went over the rectangle collision, let's add our rectangle buttons, and then we'll be done. So remember our rectangle buttons, so we'll draw a rect, and let's put this a little bit farther down the screen. So I'll put one at 100, 300, and 100 width, and 50 height. Okay, and I'll use my rectangle code. I'm going to put no stroke here because I don't think I need that. So let's add variables and then detect our collision. So we have variable x equals 100, x variable y equals 300, y, variable w for width is 100, and variable h for height is 50, w for width, and h for height. And now let's detect our collision. So if mouse x is greater than x, and mouse x is less than x plus w. See how much nicer that looks with variables than it did in the previous video. Then we do the same thing on y. If mouse y is greater than y and mouse y is less than y plus h. So if we are over the rectangle, we'll fill with yellow. And if not, we'll fill with plum. Of course, we could change those colors for a rectangle. So let's take a look at how we figure out that collision. So here's our rectangle and here's our mouse. We know that XY is this top left corner and we know that the width is the distance across and the height is the distance from the top to the bottom. So first we need to know that this mouse value is on this side of the left side of the rectangle. So it's gotta be greater than X. So that's our first condition. Then to get over here, we say, what's x? Okay, so we start at x and then we go plus w. So we also know that our mouse has to be less than x plus w. 
then we do the same thing in the other direction. So our mouse has to be greater than y up here. It has to be bigger than this line. So it has to be greater than y. And it has to be less than y plus h. So y up here plus h down here. So let's test that out. There we go. We've got our, our other rectangle. And so now, if we want to turn this guy into a function, I've already used button, so let's just create another function name. So I'll say function rect button. And we know that we need an x, a y, a width, and a height, pretty much just like our rectangle. Okay, so let's take this guy, and put it in there, and then let's call a rect button function and just put our values in. So we have x. y width height and now we can call another rect button if we just move this over and of course let's move it over a bit more to make it a little more even and we can also make it longer if we like okay that looks fine and so each one of our rectangles works and just like we did with our regular button with a sound. Let's add a rectangle button sound. I'm going to add something a little bit different because these are the longer sounds, the background music and the chicken sounds. So I'm going to add in for one rectangle, the chickens. And for the second rectangle, the background music. So first I'm going to check if the mouse is pressed. And I'm then going to check to make sure the sound is not playing. So I'm going to say not sound dot is playing. And then I'll say sound dot play. Okay, so let's try that. So we've got our background music and our explosions and our chickens. The music is much louder, so I'm going to turn that down a bit. In setup, I'm just going to say bg.setVolume, and I'll set it to uh, 0 0.1, so it'll be much quieter. So I've got my chickens, my explosions, and my other sounds. So there are a lot of other things that you could customize with your buttons to make them reflect the sounds in different ways. Um, you could add images, you could add um, different sizes, you could add different types of animations. Um, but mainly we just want to create our new custom functions so that we can reuse these interactive elements to our sketch and start to build a little bit more of a complex interaction for the user. So now we can click in specific areas that are highlighted visually, and then we can hear sounds that reflect when we click in those areas. So that's just one way to use functions. As you learn more code, you'll use functions more and more, and everything kind of gets turned into different little functions in JavaScript. Um, so we'll continue using those this semester. And so this is it for this video. I'm gonna take a little screenshot here. So I'm just gonna click Save and get a little thumbnail. So I'm going to go to my project, sound version 4, and let's grab this new thumbnail from downloads. So I'll just call this thumbnail.png. And so then I want to add a new link here. So we'll add it after our sound example and keyboard sampler. So I'll go to index.html, and I'll grab this last project and just copy and paste it. And so this is sound uh, for the thumbnail at sound version 4. Thumbnail. Sorry, I keep switching between thumbnail and some other name, but that's fine. And then we have sound version 3, sound version 4 for our links. And so the first one is our interaction uh, 2 example with collisions and then we have our sound sampler with the mouse okay so 
Let's make sure those work. Okay, looks good. So we're good to go. So I'm just gonna close these guys, make a new commit. and commit to master and push to the origin. Um, so with sounds, just as with images, definitely make sure to check your site online before you turn it in and make sure that you don't have any typos in the file names or anything else that's giving you any errors. But other than that, you should be good to go. Um, and so let me know if you have any questions on Discord or email or you can ask me in class.